Hey there, movie fans. Welcome to Collider's For Your Consideration, our weekly award series tracking the ups and downs of award season. Very excited because Collider FYC has a screening series this, this season. We're very excited on, on what is it? December 3rd. December 3rd. December 3rd. I'm like, man, we're already into There's December. There's so many dates, too. So we many have a lot dates. of cool stuff coming up. A lot of cool stuff. So on December 3rd, we are going to have an FYC screening of Joker that will be moderating a Q&A with the uh, director of photography on that. And then on December 7th, we're going to have a Q&A for Rocketman. Tickets are available for both of these screens, so please get them while you can. This Rocketman Q&A is going to be with uh, Taryn Edgerton, director Dexter Fletcher, and co-star Jamie Bell. So that's December 3rd for Joker and December 7th for Rocketman. We're very excited because our friends at Arclight are sponsoring this season of Collider FYC. And Collider, you know, and Arclight go hand in hand. They've had a great screening series so far, so we're just extending that with our Collider FYC screening series. Joining me this week, the amazing Perry Nemiroff is back after running the New York Marathon, bungee jumping, and celebrating her birthday. I've had a good November. She's had a good November, <laughs> and she's going to have an even better December. I like hearing missing, that. Missing this time. Uh, the, the mighty Jeff Snyder is already back with his family celebrating Thanksgiving. But we understand that's okay, because that gives us more time to talk <laughs> about this week's category, which is best actress yes let's get right to it okay so right. we're gonna go from five and work our way up or do you want to start at the top where let's where do we have more in line okay let's start at the top my number one still ever since the toronto international film festival is renee zellweger yep. for judy mm. that was the narrative surrounding that film from the very first screening of it was that Maybe this movie wouldn't go on to sweep nominations in many categories, but Renee Zellweger was a lock for a lead acting nomination. And I think that hasn't changed. And I also still, even with all these great performances we're about to talk about, I still think she's the front runner to win. You know, the interesting thing about Best Actress is that of all the major categories, picture, director, and all the acting categories, this is the only one that is an absolute lock. That lock, I agree, completely is Renee Zellweger. The, you know, Renee Zellweger, she took time off from acting for a little while. She already has a supporting actress mm -hmm. Oscar for 2003's Cold Mountain. And with this role, she's not only uh, back with a return to form as an actor, but she does her own singing and dancing. And a, 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 a legend like Judy Garland, in which she could have really uh, leaned in and, and gone melodramatic, like let's say Faye Dunaway, uh, and Mommy Dearest and really just like chewed her scenery, but she really humanizes Judy Garland. Mm -hmm. She she really portrays her with empathy and sympathy, but also as a, as someone who was really damaged by the Hollywood system when she was when she was younger, especially during the making of The Wizard of Oz. It is a tour de force performance. She is absolutely magnificent. This is the kind of role that is tailor made for an Oscar, yeah. for especially uh, in this case. Just the narrative surrounding it, just with her taking a break, with her playing Judy Garland, with the uh, the movie in a sense being about Hollywood yep. to a degree. I mean, it, really everything I think is working in her favor and just another way to sing her her praises in this movie, something that really blew me away was just how much chemistry she has with her entire ensemble. Yeah. And it's unique relationships with everybody, but I think she delivers a lead performance that brings something extra out of everybody around her. And I just think that speaks to uh, her ability and her the quality of this performance even more. Absolutely. And you cannot take your eyes off Renee yeah. Selweger in this role. She is just just magnificent. And in addition to her Oscar win for, for Cold Mountain, she was also nominated mm -hmm. two years in a row in a row for Bridget Jones's Diary for 2001 and Chicago in 2002. As far as Judy Garland is concerned, she never won a competitive acting Academy Award. She was nominated for both A Star is Born, Lead Actress, and Judgment at Nuremberg for Supporting Actress. Now, while she never won a competitive Oscar, she was given a an honorary Oscar called the Juvenile Award. And it's a good thing they got rid of that, but it was called the Juvenile Award. And she was given that award in 1940, of course, for her work on Wizard of Oz. So with this role, with, uh, with this role as Judy Garland, 
Renee Zellweger is going to win the Academy Award that Judy Garland herself never got. I'm afraid to go that far just because I don't want to jinx anything and I'm superstitious, but I fully believe in her at this point. Okay, then who's number two on your list? <laughs> All right, my number two right now is Scarlett Johansson for Marriage Story. I think uh, Marriage Story and The Irishman are Netflix's best chances, and I think we're going to hear Marriage Story pop up in a lot of uh, categories this year. This one in particular is... Uh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to say this one is a lock too. If I'm looking at her and Adam Driver, I think I have a little more faith in him getting the nomination, yeah, yeah, but sure. still given the the field of competition right now, I think she's got this. Also, because this isn't the only movie she had hit theaters this year. She also is part of Jojo. Avengers Avengers oh, Endgame, though. Yeah. The biggest uh, box office <laughs> moneymaker of all time. And I, you know, it might sound silly, but I think that is part of her narrative in a True. sense. But then on top of that, Jojo, Jojo Rabbit. Rabbit. I don't think she's going to get the supporting nomination for her performance in that. But I think that work in that movie is only going to fuel her chances in this category. Uh, I, you know what? You're right. I completely forgot about Avengers Endgame because it's such a big movie. A big her ensemble. name has been in the spotlight a lot. And yes, we are sitting here and, you know, Academy of Voters, maybe they should be judging one specific performance, but... Many things come into play, and when you're hearing the name Scarlett Johansson so many times in one calendar year, it's going to stick. Absolutely, and you're right. There is a lot of play. It's not just about the individual performance. It's about the career. It's about mm -hmm. the year. And uh, Scarlett Johansson never been nominated for an Academy Award. I agree she's she's a lot to get nominated for sure. Uh, I, just, I, I think Marriage Story is just a beautiful film, a really deeply moving and genuine and raw and honest film about a love, it's a love story about the dissolution of a marriage. And I just think it's a wonderful, wonderful film. Yet Scarlett Johansson was nominated for four Golden Globes for Lost in Translation, Girl with the Pearl Earring. Both of those movies came out in 2003, so she was a double nominee. Uh, Best Actress Comedy for Lost in Translation and Best, Best Actress Drama for Girl with the Pearl Earring. She was also nominated for 2005's Match Point, which I love, mm -hmm. and a love song for Bobby Long. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So one and two, we agree on. Yeah. Oh, okay. So we're still in order, too. Yes, we are. All right, I'm curious if I if I screw it up with this one. I'm um, going Saoirse Ronan for Little Women at number three. Okay. I just I got a very good feeling, especially after seeing the movie, and it is now firmly in my top ten of the year. Mm -hmm. I re I really really adored this. I mean, if you watch <laughs> Movie Talk, did. where the two of us are on it, and I think part of the reason why I'm so shocked by how hard I fell for this movie is because I have purposely avoided this story for a very long time because I just didn't think that it suited my my storytelling taste mm -hmm. and turns out that was the complete opposite for a number of reasons I'm going to be rooting for this movie in many a category mm -hmm. but this is another thing where you gotta take into account Sir Sharonin's history also I mean it is incredible. She just delivers time and time again. And actually, bringing back a comment I made about Renee Zellweger, look at what Saoirse Ronan does in this movie and how many important relationships she has with the entire ensemble around her. And, you know, Joe is the anchor of that story, and she serves as the anchor of it so, so well. Absolutely, she gives you a foundation. Yeah. She is so important to the structure of this movie and Greta Gerwig's unique approach to telling that story. So I think their work goes hand in hand. Then you also look at what Joe brings out of all of her sisters around Timmy uh, out of Timmy Chalamet's character I mean there are so many things I think that just speak to how great she is as the lead in an ensemble piece uh, you know, it is it is an ensemble piece yes. but I think you're right that it, that even with all of the great actors and actresses around her she does shine through and uh, you know especially towards the end you know she has a couple yeah. of great scenes that you can actually see the words for your consideration you really under can them. yeah yeah no, there's I, so I agree. much complexity to a role like that because you know you get the impression that that joe is you know super strong and confident but then she has these moments where she breaks and i feel like because saoirse ronan earns those moments yep. so so well mm -hmm. i mean it, it moves you 10 times more than many other things that i've seen like that this year you know go back to your point about how initially little women wasn't a movie that really spoke to you it wasn't like you're like oh my god i can't wait to see this movie i i i i Obvi wasn't either. It wasn't like on my must-see list, even though I, I loved Lady Bird. I think Greta Gerwig, obviously, yeah. with these two films now under her belt as a director, she clearly is, is a terrific director. Um, but when a movie is good, a movie is good. 
the bottom line is whether it speaks to you, whether the plot or the the, the storyline speaks to you or not. If a movie is good, it'll win you over. And I think that this movie did that with both of us. A movie doesn't even have to speak directly to you. Another quality that I absolutely love in movies, and this is true of some of my favorites mm. over over the course of my entire life for that matter, is when a movie doesn't speak to me, but it gives me a little insight into somebody's life who is completely different from me. It's like well, it could go one too. way or the yeah, other. Yeah. You know, uh, when it came to doing this list, I knew that our one and two was gonna were gonna match. Okay. And I so knew our three that does not. <laughs> the 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 others we might have different placings, and then you know the conversation really begins when you get into the honorable mentions. But yeah, but, uh, Saoirse was not my number three. Saoirse was my number five, okay. which I was going I was going okay. back and forth between Saoirse and another actress who who is now my honorable mentions for for my number five. But my number three is Aquafina for huh. the farewell wow you ranked her a good deal number higher than i three. did yes oh I'm, is she on your list she's on my list at number five but Ooh, the okay. the five spot is the one i am the most wishy-washy about so you're wishy-washy about aquafina oh it's just i think uh <laughs> I think she deserves it. Oh, it's, I love if, her if I were picking who got the nominations, she would firmly be on my list. I'm just, I'm still a little uncertain how loud the conversation about the farewell is going to be through the sea. It's like, what am I thinking about? The farewell this year, and they're, these are two completely different stories, I know, but the farewell this year feels like last year's eighth grade, where oh, we thought it yeah. had a chance mm -hmm. in a bunch of categories, not the same categories necessarily, but we thought it had a chance, and you just kind of have to, you have to wait it out and see, you know, the ebbs and flows of that conversation as we get closer to nomination time. Turns out it didn't pan out well for eighth grade, but... I do believe that overall, whether we're talking about Aquafina or other categories, I think The Farewell does have a better chance. Uh, you bring up a great point with the eighth grade, which was also moving from A24. Yeah. And by the way, just A24's slate in 2019, you know, with The Lighthouse and oh, it's Waves. Oh, so and good. I mean, if it's, I feel like if it's an A24 movie, it has to be good. Uh, it is, uh, you know, they're, they're just really, are just releasing great movies. But... With regards to your comment about, about eighth grade sort of missing the boat with Best Picture, I think there is a possibility that could happen with The Farewell. But I think that The Farewell will fare better in the screenplay category. Yes. And I think that it'll also fare better in Best Actress because while it, Farewell has a lot of competition for Best Picture and Best Director, Aquafina was such a standout. It, you know, she really proved that she could do a dramatic role not that she had a whole big history of doing comedic roles but this was a big a big uh, change for her after crazy rich Asians as the comedic scene stealer of that movie and she's so many layers so so much complexity as a as a woman who's trapped between two different homes mm -hmm. new york and and china and i just it was a, a wonderful movie heartfelt deeply moving, funny, and heartbreaking at the same time. And it's just, I really think that also because the movie did make almost $20 million mm -hmm. domestically, making it the second highest grossing independent movie of 2019, currently behind Peter Butter Falcon, I think that uh, Aquafina was a Man. revelation and she'll get nominated. One, I wish we were talking about Peanut Butter Falcon and these conversations even more, but that's besides the point. Yeah, I agree. I also think what's working in The Farewell and Aquafina's favor is the fact that, you know, I think certain other categories are a little more overcrowded than this one. And, you know, we could save this for when we get into honorable mentions, I but I, I do think the fact that you know, there is a certain type of person that's dominating this conversation leaves a slot open where we're going to have to see representation. I think that the need for that to happen in this category is going to define one of these spots. I think that could work in our favor. And also the fact that when I look at the outliers right now, I don't think anybody has a real chance. I think in general, I know you're probably going to get to this, but I think when I, when I was trying to pick my top five of my honorable mentions, you know, and I went on Gold Derby with a little bit of help on this because it occurred to me that overall, this category is a little weak. Not like Best Actor where there are so many honorable yeah. mentions which could easily knock off someone else. I feel like that's not the case with Best Actress, and that's a shame. I don't think the performances are weak, but again, we're sitting here trying to predict who's going to get the nominations. Yeah. And I think, uh, 
I think maybe in some cases it's, you know, it's a little bit of a Renee Zellweger, Judy kind of situation yeah, it where is. it doesn't fare as well as that, where you've got this great lead performance from a lead actress, mm -hmm. but the movie doesn't meet their level and that's kind of taken them out of the conversation or just the promo campaign, the Oscar campaign hasn't been strong enough to push them into the mix. This right now seems like, I think I'm looking at the most realistic list, but I think when I scroll down at the possibilities, maybe some of these other folks would be more deserving. So your number three is my number five, and my yes. number three is your number five. So I that know leaves who your number one. four is. Now you go, you say it. It's you Charlize. Say it. Charlize. Charlize Theron. Charlize Theron. Um, I think she's <laughs> phenomenal in uh, Bombshell, uh, and I am a big fan of that movie in general. I was just, I was riveted yeah, by yeah. that film. Mm -hmm. I think the pacing and the style, I mean, the comparison that I keep making is, you know, and maybe it's a little cliche thing to say, but it's this year's Vice. There's something about telling that story with such energy and style, and also when you have Charlize in the lead role and you've got a... Margot Robbie in the supporting category. And I also think Nicole Kidman should get into the sporting category, but that's a conversation for another time. I don't think it's happening, but I think that that movie just, I, I was mesmerized. Yep. It's like part of me didn't want to look, but I couldn't take my eyes off of it. Here's the other thing about Charlie's that weighs in her favor. Uh, first of all, I remember when the trailer, that first teaser trailer first dropped for Bombshell. And Makes you see, an impression. You, you, you see Megan Kelly and you see uh, Gretchen Carlson mm -hmm. and you see Margot Robbie's character in the elevator. And I kept looking, wow, they got Megan Kelly for this? <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, holy Toledo, she looks just like her. So the thing about the makeup of this movie, like when you have a character like Gary Oldman as Churchill in Darkest Hour where he's just like buried under the makeup, yeah, that's impressive. But when you have makeup that's a lot more subtle and really needs to look realistic like this does for Charlie's playing Megan Kelly. I think that's I think that's actually harder because you don't want to show where the makeup ends and where the actual facial features begin. So that's a that's a huge yeah. testament to the makeup team behind Bombshell. Second of all, obviously a very timely, relevant, important story to be told and the way it's told by director Jay Roach is is just terrific. Third of all, and this is really important, and Academy voters will know this, that Charlize Theron produced this movie. Mm. Not only did she produce this movie, Very good point. but she saved the film because two weeks before they were ready to start shooting Bombshell, Annapurna Pictures dropped out as the main financier for this movie. And she scrambled and they got Lionsgate to pick up the tab. The movie rolled forward because with an ensemble like this, if you push back the start date, then you're going to have to recast the movie because everyone moves on to everything else. And with a cast of this size, then you, you know, you're not going to be able to get the same actors. So mm -hmm. she did save the movie from being made. She saved an important movie for being made. Like you said, a riveting, mesmerizing film. And absolutely, Charlie's is a standout. Of course, Charlie's Theron, an Oscar winner for 2003's Monster. That was 16 years ago. She's ready for another. And this is the one where she's going to get nominated. Yeah, for I'm, sure. I'm at feeling extremely extremely confident in this entire list <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> i i don't really at this point see any it's not even like we're waiting for anything like i don't see anything shaking this up now well maybe there is maybe there is i'm curious to see who who you're gonna propose because like i'm looking at my list and i know who i want to shake this list up but i don't think it's happening okay well before we get into the honorable mentions that we have listed there is a movie that could potentially, and I mean potentially, because the reaction to the trailer oh, of this you're movie. Gonna, I know no, 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 wait a minute. Say. Just go with me on this. All just right, go with all me right. On this because Perry, you know, the trailer, all right, I'm just gonna say it. All right. Are you ready? Are you ready for this? Here it is, here it is, here it is. Cats. Okay, wait, don't shoot me. Don't give me the hate on the YouTube comments. <sighs> don't retweet me with, with negative comments on cats because the trailer looked bad. Just hear me out on this. First time I saw that first trailer for Cats, yes, I definitely went, oh, this is a little awkward. It, 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 was, it was perplexing to me. It was, it, it didn't sit, it, it, it wasn't an easy embrace. But then when I watched the trailer again on the big screen before I think I saw, I think it was Ford Ferrari, uh, and I watched the trailer again, okay, so now I knew what to expect. And I, I took to this, the trailer for Cats a lot better than I did the first time. The point being this, Perry, when you're watching a movie that is different, yes, those differences are initially going to be jarring, but then you just get absorbed by it, you accept it, 
You stop thinking about it, and the power of the film takes hold. So who knows who could actually squeak by with a nomination for Cats because Jennifer Hudson's performance in Dreamgirls when she sang, and I'm telling you I'm not going, that won her an Academy Award. She could easily just have a great number in Cats, like memories that puts her in the best actress race. Maybe, I'm just speculating. Maybe, 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 maybe. Maybe, just go with me on this. No, you're not going with me I can't, on this. I can't, I can't. I, I'm not saying that I don't hope you're right because I'm always rooting for a movie to surprise I me. If you do something, be... if you something, you do something different and take a risk and it doesn't pan out, I still applaud you for taking the risk. This is a risk that I don't think is going to pan out in the way that they intend. I do think that this could be a morbid curiosity thing. <laughs> I think it could be a cult classic because it's such like a wacky approach to a big screen, big budget studio movie. But I really do not think if I'm making the prediction right now that Cats is going to hit theaters and we will be taking it as a serious Oscar contender. Well, it could go either way. And really, with all the movies that we've now seen, I think you still have to see Richard Jewell. Okay. I do have to see Richard. I still have to see Richard Jewell. Mm -hmm. There was something else that you had brought up that I still haven't seen. I, uh, you saw 1917. We'll I get saw to 1917, that in a yeah. And, oh, uh, I've and Cats. Seen yeah. What else? What else? Oh, Rise, wow. of, Rise of Skywalker? Well, yeah, Rise of Skywalker. I mean, that's the technical categories. Yeah, we sure, do need that sure. one. Okay, um, so in terms of honorable mentions, okay. Perry, so if I could force one of my honorable mentions into the top five, mm. I think everybody knows this because I've already brought it up on a previous episode of the show. It's Lupita Nyong'o for us. Okay. The fact that she is not being seriously considered right now is absolutely criminal to me. So if we have our top fives as the most likely nominees, and then let's say I'm looking at a group of maybe, um, I would probably say at this point, three other possible outliers who could get in. Lupita Nyong'o is one of them. It's just, it, it saddens me that I think her chances aren't good enough to actually make it happen. I agree with it's you. It's a shame. I agree with you. And the thing is about Lupita Nyong'o in Us, she's playing two roles, okay? And she has to, uh, and then there's the payoff of playing those two roles, which is like really, which sort of seals yeah. the deal for the movie. So Lupita Nyong'o, absolutely, that's a magnificent performance. You know, I, I think that I sort of, uh, uh, you know, the more I thought about the movie itself, the more I started to question it. I think there's holes in it. It doesn't hold up as well for me, but I agree, no question about the Lupita Nyong'o's performance. Performances are both terrific. Strike one is that the film opened in March, okay? And it, it opened so long ago that people are not talking about it as much. It's such a stupid thing. Like, just because it opened in March, no, but it, it, I mean, it goes, get as it much goes talk. with the things that we bring up all the time as far as awards campaign. Yeah. I mean, look at what I just said about Scarlett Johansson. You hear her name enough in a single calendar year that can change someone's chances. So if you are that far removed from the release of a movie and Oscar voting time, it makes sense. The other thing against her, and this shouldn't be against her because the performance should get nominated based on its own merits is the fact that she does have an Academy Award already for supporting actress for 12 years a slave. That was a breakthrough, breakout You performance. said that works against her. Well, they might say, well, she already has an Oscar. So why does that work against her, but it doesn't work against other people in this category that we've already named? Well, uh, that's a great question. <laughs> that's a great question. I think more because of the timing. I'm just going with the timing of it. You know, people might be, oh, what came out in March? Oh, and she already has an Oscar. Whereas Renee Zellweger, she's been out of the game for so long and she's back with a vengeance. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a different kind of thing in terms of timing because, uh, you know, people are reminded of how great uh, uh, Renee Zellweger as an actress is. And I she gave the performance of her career. And I can see that becoming the narrative. It's just, it's frustrating to me to hear that because I think there's no basis to a thought process like that. But this is, but this goes back to what you said at the top of this conversation, or was it on the other show, Movie Talk, it's possible. where you said how, I know, uh, where you said how there are a lot of factors in play. Oh my God, yeah. Yeah, that was Movie Talk. Whether yeah. we're talking about uh, Oscar consideration or box office, yep. you name it. There, I, I really do believe that there's never one single factor that like torpedoes something. I think it's, it's a, a multitude of things. Did you see the movie Harriet? I did see Harriet. So... Cynthia Erivo, I think, is one of the most talented individuals out there. I, anytime Cynthia Erivo signs up for a movie, I will go see it. I think her performance in Harriet is great, but I, I think this is an example opposite to Renee Zellweger, where the movie overall doesn't quite meet her level, yeah, and it's yeah. going the opposite, where she's not 
she's not being propelled forward. It's dragging her down. I know. It's, it's you know, I, I felt like Harriet was a very good story. It's told in a very kind of conventional way. It felt like a TV movie. But I thought that Cynthia Riva was magnificent in the film. And she's definitely deserving of a nomination. Mm -hmm. But I think that you have to think about Judy as a movie, not, not talking about the subject matter of these films, the way that the movies were made. I thought that Judy was a good movie. And I thought Harriet was an okay movie. Okay, I uh, could see I that. I think that both of these films are uh, elevated by the performances of these actresses. You can in the all case of Judy, in the case of Judy, I thought going into the film before I saw it, I didn't have high hopes for the film, but I knew Renee would be great. And I was surprised because, yeah, Renee was great, but the movie was actually really, really mm -hmm. good. Uh, with Harriet, uh, I thought the movie was going to be really, really good, and it was just okay. Mm -hmm. But I still thought uh, Cynthia's performance was was terrific. I think a great way to get into perspective how these two movies are doing in this conversation compared to one another mm. is to look at the conversation coming out of TIFF. Look at their premieres. Yeah, you're right. Everyone was talking about Renee Zellweger, and I think there was some great disappointment in Harriet. Yeah, it was yeah, a big, it was a big yeah, deal. Yeah, Harry right. Tubman's first feature film. I mean, that that's huge, and I still think it was a good movie. Like I thought it was good. I was riveted by it, and I thought it had some great moments. Right. But right. you know, you talk about a movie like that starring Cynthia Erivo, and you expect it to be up here, completely, and it's just here. Completely agree. Another film that could be sort of a dark horse because it hasn't opened yet. I think I know where you're going with this one. Clemency? Yes. So, uh, actually, there's another one that I haven't seen. I keep missing Clemency, and okay. I need to put it on the list. But Alfred Woodard is someone that I'm watching out for right now. Put it on your list because it is a great movie, and it, it is uh, a, a magnificent performance from Alfred Woodard. This movie premiered at the Cannes Film Festival, and I, it definitely won a top prize. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alfred Woodard, you know, she plays a warden at a prison who uh, has to deal with, among other things, at the prison, the prisoners on death row. And after years and years of doing this, it starts to affect her. She has a crisis of conscience with one of the death row uh, inmates in particular, and she just sort of unravels her, her, her beliefs and unravels her family as well, her marriage. Uh, but but Avery Water is magnificent. It's a gripping film. It's a powerful film, and, and it ha doesn't open until late December or so. I don't think enough people have seen it. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, but I think that that could absolutely change the game. And maybe, I, I don't know, maybe that knocks off Aquafina. I don't know. That, that's kind of where I have it. Yeah. I have Aquafina in, in that fifth spot. And I think the only two with a chance of knocking her out of it are probably Alfre Woodard and Lupita Nyong'o. What about Joni? Jody Turner Smith in Queen and Slim. I think her chances of getting into this category are slim to none, oh. <laughs> but what a fantastic first lead performance Great. in a feature film. Mm -hmm. I like I think that movie overall is just not getting the campaign that Why? it needs to. Why do you think that? It might be because it just hasn't hit theaters nationwide at this point and I'm not hearing enough talk about it, but there's something, you know, it's like in my brain in order to picture the landscape properly it's got like i've got my top tier the one that like i'm hearing about all the all the time sure. and then you know the next level down is probably something like a queen and slim and i for one i thought that movie was great there's certain little beats here and there that i don't think work as well as intended but I, I think they don't work about. as well as intended because they decided to take a big risk and that risk didn't pay off. And like I've already said, like I applaud risk taking big time. And mm -hmm, it's like in mm -hmm. that case, I don't think it ruins the movie by any means, but I think it could have been stronger done another way. But the performances in that movie in particular, Daniel Kaluuya and Jody Turner Smith are excellent. That is some of the best cast chemistry I've seen the entire year. The casting and the chemistry of that movie is what made the movie for me because I agree with you that that this movie, I think it's a very, very, very good film. On um, Rotten Tomatoes, the ratings are, are absolutely superb. But if you read the actual pull quotes and read the actual reviews, which you should do in a movie like this, uh, you know, at least maybe after you see it, mm -hmm. so you can see if they drive with what you're thinking, is that the movie has great moments. It's a well-intentioned film. It's a topical film. It, it's, again, the chemistry between uh, Jodie Turner-Smith and Daniel Kaluuya, who's an Oscar nominee for Get Out. Uh, the problem that I have with the movie is that the inciting incident that starts the movie, and I want to spoil it, mm -hmm. uh, it felt like a cliche. 
It felt like a cliche, and it's been done in other films. It was a plot point in last year's The Hate You Give. So when that sort of contrivance starts the movie, it's a little hard to recover from that. And yet I also felt, Perry, that there were other contrivances in the movie that I couldn't get past. Now, the thing about Queen and Slim is that a lot of people are talking about it like, oh, it's this year's Bonnie and Clyde. I look at it as this year's Thelma and Louise. Only, you know, not two women with a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it definitely plays out like a Thelma and Louise. And I liked it very much. I thought it was a very, very strong, good movie. Not a great one. Perhaps it's been done before. And yes, you can draw similarities to uh, to The Hate You Give and what kicks off the, uh, the story for that. But I think there's a reason we're seeing those stories on screen more often than not right now because those stories need to be told. And sadly, that is our reality. And I think the Queen and Slim story comes with more than enough nuances to separate it from everything else. And I think one of, one of the ones in particular that really stood out to me was how unique the relationship between the those two characters feel, yep. particularly Jodie Turner Smith's character. That there was just something about her where at the very beginning I'm like, you know, like like I can't I can't quite figure you out, and that's not a bad thing. I am enjoying peeling back the layers of, of you and how you're responding to the situation and how you're responding to this person that you went on a Tinder date with, and I got the impression that you guys weren't quite feeling each other, and I oh. like seeing you evolve together. Yes. There was something very unique about those characters, and I think think that made Queen and Slim stand out from anything I've ever seen like it from before. Well, the thing about Queen and Slim, so the movie opens now. It's open in theaters uh, November 27th, which is today. So do check it out this Thanksgiving weekend. It's a very, very good film. And let us know what you think on the comments below. Uh, P. Nemiroff is her Twitter handle. My Twitter handle is Movie Mance. And before we get into our, our top five lock list, and before we get into some other FYC type of uh, discussion here. Just want to say again, we want to give a big shout out and huge thanks to our sponsor for this season of Collider FYC. That is our friends at Arclight Cinemas. I just love the Arclight Cinemas. It's really like, I get so excited when we go to that theater at the, the one in Hollywood yeah. uh, for our screenings. You know, we're there a lot and we're going to be there a lot coming up because next week, the week of December 3rd, we have two very, very big screenings that uh, we're going to be screening at the Arclight Cinemas in Hollywood on December 3rd. We have Joker. This movie is a $1 billion box office smash, and we are very excited to be co conducting a post-screening Q&A conversation with Director of Photography Lawrence Schur. Do not miss this. Go online. Get your tickets right now for December 3rd at the Arclight for Joker. And then on December 7th, which is Saturday, this one is also a biggie. Very excited for Rocket Man at 7 p.m. Saturday, December 7th at the Arclight Cinema in Hollywood. Followed by a Q&A with Taron Edgerton, Jamie Bell, and director Dexter Fletcher. Like, how awesome it is re this? It really is. This I is can't, so I can't get over this. And I, like, not, not to, like, keep plugging arc life but i just I very freaking love that place i, I was just it. there last night watching knives out in the dome and i don't I'm, i was just so happy it's so so great and so okay so let's get into our, our lock for top five okay. I, I don't think this is going to be too difficult. no no i mean the the top two are guarantees yeah top two we got renee zoliger at number one she's not just a lock for number one but you know she's definitely the front runner you know because you know we don't want to jinx it too much here i think she's the front runner yeah. to win followed by scarlett johansson at number two then uh, uh, the rest of the top three let's move charlize up to number three i'm fine with that okay okay and so then, charlize is our three charlize is number three and then saoirse ronan at number four yes. and then aquafina at number five i'm down with that list okay now since you missed out oh, last week okay wait let i me gotta ask over. you know the, uh, me and Jeff Snyder and John Roca talked about best supporting actor, and I kept wondering, what does Perry, what does Perry normal activity, <laughs> the amazing Perry Nemiroff, think about best supporting actor? So now is your chance to give me your top five picks for best supporting actor. Perry, go. I've got a little updating to do, to be honest. That's and okay. <laughs> especially because um, I did just see... 1917 okay. and I don't know how much that's really weighing on me right now but I'm rooting for someone to get in for that I think that my I think my three locks in the top three mm -hmm. are Brad Pitt okay Al Pacino 
Okay. Joe Pesci. Okay. Uh, in no right. order there. Huh. Um, I did have Anthony Hopkins in my top five for a little while. I am starting to lose some faith in two popes. Why? You're losing. Wait, wait. Was that a pun? <laughs> you're losing faith. You're getting. You're popes? getting to my head after <laughs> that movie talk episode. Um, yeah, I think he. I think he's still in the mix right now, okay. just because of you know the odds and the other outliers in that conversation. Not necessarily having a firm chance to get in, but. Two popes keep slipping further and further down my list ever since TIFF. I okay. think there's just been less talk about it. All right, what else? The other one that I am seriously considering right now is uh, is Tom Hanks. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, A Beautiful Day is, is a crowd pleaser. There's a lot of goodwill, a lot of Mr. Rogers fans out there. I'm curious to see uh, how it continues to do at the box office because it didn't have the hottest start in the world. But... The one that I think I actually, all right, wait, I'm going to say two that I, I think are outliers, but if I could like freaking shove them into this conversation right now, I would. One is Shia LaBeouf. Uh, Okay. I'm glad you brought him up. Go ahead. ahead, Shia LaBeouf and I would take it for Honey Boy or Peanut Butter Falcon. Just get him a nomination for one or the other. He's had such a great year. Those two movies are so, so good. The other one is Waves, Sterling K. Brown. Okay, here's the thing. So last week we went with Brad Pitt, Al Pacino, uh, Tom Hanks, uh, Anthony Hopkins, and we did put Shia LaBeouf in our top five. You didn't put Joe Pesci in there? No, we didn't. I, I, I was against Joe Pesci because oh, I felt no, like no. if you're going to have one actor represent Mm-mm. the Irishman, I, I don't know. I think they're I, mean, a pa- I think they're a package deal. I, I, I don't, think that's I, don't. I think that's their narrative this year is that the two of them are going into it's like these two epic legends, these three epic legends who came together and made a movie with I another agree. legend are all going to go into Oscar season I agree. together. Maybe if there was a if we had six picks, no. I would have put Pesci in there. But the reason I chose. Pacino over Pesci. First of all, if Pacino's uh, as Jimmy Hoffa, it's a showier role that it plays is. to Pacino's strengths. Whereas uh, Joe Pesci was very, very different from the Pesci we've seen in Goodfellas and Casino, which is which is also good because he's not playing the same person. And yes, while it is Joe Pesci's first uh, movie in nine years and everyone loves him, everyone's mm-hmm. talking about him and he is great. I just think that, you know, Shia LaBeouf, Okay, you know, look, he was great in Peanut Butter Falcon, but I, that probably was a lead, even though he was also yeah, a lead no, in Honey Boy. But Shia LaBeouf did get nominated for supporting actor for his performance in Honey Boy for an Independent Spirit Award. But he also is playing his father. It's a very personal story. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it's uh, about the dark side of uh, Hollywood and show business. And I think for, for Shia who just gave a magnificent performance by any measure, regardless of who he was playing or the, the relationship to the yeah. character he was playing. I just think that people will acknowledge that he really, really put himself out there with a therapeutic kind of role. I and hope then, you're right. And, 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 and Hopkins was also in there. Can I ask five. you about one other individual yeah. who has good odds right now, but I keep avoiding his name. Go ahead. Willem Dafoe for the lighthouse. Oh yeah, yeah. People were up in. Uh, people are people, people are were really pissed that well, we didn't include him. Many yeah. many are talking very highly about his work in that movie, and I think I think both of them are great. It's it's so tough because I could look at a movie like that and say like those are awards worthy performances, but there's you know there's only five spots, and we're not giving you our favorites. We are predicting things right now. I just have a feeling like The Lighthouse isn't going to get in anywhere at the Oscars. You know, I think the way in for The Lighthouse is through Willem Dafoe. Yes. And I think that Willem Dafoe's As supporting do performance does have the best shot. And he could very well do it, and he certainly deserves to. And I think the other thing that could push him in, knocking off someone like Anthony Hopkins or Shia LaBeouf, what could get Willem Dafoe in Perry is the fact that he was nominated last year for At Eternity's Gate, and he was nominated the year before for The Florida Project. He's on a roll. He's a great actor. He's a legend. He's a phenomenal actor. He deserves to be nominated. But in terms of like picking the top five, Jeff and me and, uh, and Roka went with the Pacino, Pitt, 
uh, Hopkins, Hanks, and, and LaBeouf. Now, there, there out of is, those five. There is so little representation this year. It's it's wildly alarming. Yeah, I mean, maybe is. I need to revisit some of the other uh, conversations but we've Stone had. But just Brown like, worthy. you know, look at, looking at this list and also, you know, when we're just talking about Best Actress, it's... I, I fear it's a, the nominations it's a list. a problem. Because I think that representation is going to be sorely lacking. I, th I think it's going to be a problem And it's going to come down again to the fact that there just weren't enough roles for representation to be but it's like even for this category in particular you know how big of a kelvin harrison jr fan i know I am. oh loose and waves like great i mean yes. Lu loose could be a lead performance it and i think be. that's a worthy nomination right there and the same goes for his work in waves that role because i was just re-watching waves because i was wondering you know i saw it for the first time at tiff it's in that haze where i've seen a million movies and i'm so so tired but i really really liked it and then i watched it again at home on my screener and i was able to like like really Really sit and focus and pick through everything. That performance is so incredibly complex and I mean, it, Especially it the seems part. to me like it's extremely difficult and he just knocks it out of the park with every single thing I see from him and I want to see, I know he's getting some love in the independent scene that's not enough. It's not no, enough. No. Well, Waves in general is not getting enough love at I know. all. I think uh, you know, that's a film that look, could, could break through and it should. It's a it's a it's an amazing movie. You know, when I saw it at uh, Telluride, uh, you know, I went to a, a late screening mm -hmm. and I was you know already kind of tired from the day. But the movie just like woke me up. I was riveted and mesmerized. And you're right, Kelvin Harrison Jr. Both waves and I loose. have seen Loose too many times this it's year. So my movie. first my first half of the year problem is I find movies that I love and rather than seeing new movies, I have a habit of watching them over and over and over again. And speaking of Neon, it was with Loose and Wild Rose. I must I, I abuse those screeners. Oh, I I, I watch Apollo. 11 all oh, the time I, I'm also sure. a neon movie um all right who wins supporting actor who, who wins? wins who wins give it give it to me per the oscar goes based, to based on on my standpoint regarding the irishman where mm -hmm. they're a package deal they're both getting in together i i think maybe brad pitt could walk away from it because if they do get in together like i think is going to happen they could split votes and that could push brad pitt to the top especially because i, I don't know i think overall once upon a time in hollywood is going to have a strong campaign yep. where it's mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. like you know all the boats rise or whatever that phrase is you know <laughs> they're all going to rise together yeah yeah now listen i think pitt is the front runner to win uh it would be his second oscar actually but his first for acting mm. because he won as a producer yeah. for 12 Years a Slave. You're right. You know, Brad Pitt's work as an actor gets a ton of praise as it should, but he is also a phenomenal producer and he, is. he, already, he does have an Academy Award for, for producing 12 mm. Years a Slave or co-producing 12 Years a Slave. All right, so that's our list. And just before we go, we just have to talk about a big, fat, huge, massive Oscar contender that finally screened and oh. like a lot of people were talking about, maybe could have really shaken, changed the game for the Academy Awards, especially for Best Picture and Best Director. That movie is? 1917. 1917. I wonder what's gonna happen with this one. I do think it's it's a Best P Picture contender for mm -hmm. sure. One of the things that's stressing me out a little, and this isn't a bad thing, it's a, it's a good thing for one category. I think the technical achievements in that are overshadowing the performances because Dean Charles Chapman and George McKay are so yeah, they're great. good in it. I really do think, like I, I'm sure they're gonna get a lot of praise and a lot of credit, but they need even more than I suspect they are going to get because it's not just the way that movie is shot from a technical perspective. They also have to hit their marks. They have to emote. They have to not mess up a super long time. I know there are hidden cuts all throughout the movie, but that's still an extreme amount of content to convey in one single take and their work is truly exceptional in this movie. The the technical prowess of this film is unprecedented. Yes. And yes, it is. I don't want to take away from that at all. Right. No. 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 But but also, you're talking about a, a concept of a movie seemingly done in one take, but not actually yeah. done in one take, but seemingly done. That was used for Birdman, which won Best Picture for 2014. Mm -hmm. Now, not taking anything away from that, because it is obviously a very very challenging challenging uh, uh, to thing to pull off. And when I was watching the movie, I was thinking about how, you know, the one take approach of it all does make you feel like you're involved, like you're in it. It's an immersive experience. But it's also, I was thinking about how, you know, like when you take a war film like 1917, 
the word choreography is not a word that you would generally use for a war film, but the choreography of everyone hitting their marks, like you said, is a word that is, that is used uh, in, in the right sense. Now, I love 1917. I think it's absolutely a big contender for best picture and best director, but I still... I felt like when I when the movie was over and I was caught up in it, I said, this is it, this is the one. Mm -hmm. But then I slept on it, I started yeah. thinking about it more. And I still don't think, Perry, when it comes to best picture, I still think Whoa. this race is wide open. Oh, I mean, I think the race is wide open as far as the win goes, but I don't, I don't think there's any scenario where 1917 doesn't get a nomination. Oh, no, it gets nominated. Yeah, yeah. But like, I no, felt I think like the race this is wide could open be the one too. to win. But I don't think it's going to be the one. I mean, it could be, and it should be, but so should Once Upon a Time, so should The Irishman, so should Marriage yeah. Story, and I, so should Jojo Rabbit. And you know what? I'm going to say this again. I, I don't know if I said it on the show, or maybe I did last week with, uh, with John and Jeff, that, that Ford versus Ferrari is a very strong contender. Yeah. Everyone loves Ford versus Ferrari. After that opening, I have more faith in that actually getting into the conversation. Everyone, lo it's a rousing film, true story. It's an underdog story. Again, this is also a very much a, a big below the line kind of film yeah. in addition to above the line for picture and, and you know, maybe actor for Christian Bale, Matt Damon. But uh, it is, it is a, it's a, it makes you feel good. And it's, a, uh, you don't need to know anything about cars. It, it kind of, even though the movies are very different, it could be this year's Green Book. I take you, that for what you, you will. You never know. You never know. I still, I still back to nineteen seventeen just briefly. I still can't quite compute. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. I, I was so bowled over by what I saw, especially when you talk about choreography and just how many people must have been. Like, I want to know just like the company count on just just give me one shot. I don't care what shot it is yep. between background, your main players, all the all the behind the scenes folks that need to be on hand to move stuff around. The coordination in that is staggering. So I think before it really seeps in, I need to sit back and think about it even more and watch it again and start to pick out little details. But can I just tell you, it's got one of my favorite shots of the entire year. And I'm isolating one specific moment. I don't specifically know when it starts and stops in reality, but it's in the trailer to a degree. It's a shot of uh, a certain soldier from behind where there's like a light coming in and there's a fire in the background. And it's just, it's such a, oh, beauti yeah, yeah, it's such a yeah. beautifully constructed shot where I think the lighting in particular is what like my, my eyes, like I just lit up when I saw that oh. I was I was overwhelmed by the beauty of that shot well the overwhelming beauty of that movie and the lighting could turn into a back-to-back -back Oscar win for director of photography Roger I would believe Deakins. it I would believe I mean, it finally wins an Oscar for Blade Runner 2049 which was uh, he should yes uh, but he absolutely um uh, that this is could be one of his one of his crowning achievements. Yeah. It's a bold statement. Oh well, that was a whole lot I know. of fun, it was wasn't a lot. it? That Welcome was great. back, the amazing. I'm so happy Perry to be Nemeroff. back. So here's the thing: we want to once again thank our sponsors this year, ArcLight Cinemas, and make sure you go online and get tickets fast in Southern California. So you go to our screenings on December 3rd and December 7th. They are going to sell out, and you got FaceTime with the hosts of FYC. What could be better than that? So. So the other thing we want to do, and this is important, we really want to make sure that you go and you do your due diligence as a movie fan and spread the word on Collider FYC. Put it on Facebook, put it on Twitter, retweet it, tell your friends to retweet it, like it, comment below on YouTube and tell us what you think. Hit us up on Twitter at P Nemiroff and at Movie Mance and also at Collider Video, hashtag Collider FYC. And until next week, happy Thanksgiving and FY. See you later.